It might be hard to remember or even to imagine if you weren't actually there when it happened, but there was a time where Saw, which is now a mega franchise with 10 movies, was a groundbreaking indie horror smash hit. With a low budget, a villain with a brutal yet intriguing MO and a genuinely shocking plot twist for the time, Saw exploded in popularity and became a horror sensation damn near overnight when it came out back in 2004. Tons of sequels followed. It was to the point where new movies were coming out every year and proudly presented themselves as being a Halloween tradition. And Jigsaw, Billy the Puppet and Pighead took their place right beside absolute horror icons like Freddy, Jason, Leatherface, Michael, Chucky and the rest. That's not to say that Saw never faced any trouble though. Critics were never too fond of the series and as the sequels grew to focus more and more on the death traps themselves rather than the reason people were in those death traps, the series got accused of being nothing more than completely mindless torture porn. Now, I'm not necessarily the biggest Saw fan on the planet, but I gotta say, I don't really agree with that. First of all, Saw doesn't even come close to having invented that subgenre of horror, even if it did popularize it for a while. I mean, seriously, look at some movies from the 70s if you don't believe me. Plus, it does have a much higher focus on Jigsaw's motivations and the effects his legacy has on people, along with a more sprawling, ongoing story with tighter continuity than most of its slasher contemporaries. And that's not even getting into the admittedly interesting theming behind some of the death traps and why the victims are put in them, no matter how on the nose they might seem at times. And speaking of the plot, I will admit that it gets pretty silly watching the series keep pulling the same two rabbits out of its hat and expecting us to be impressed every time. Yeah, I didn't say these movies were perfect or anything. Now, with the 10th movie out in theaters, I started thinking about something. Like, how come we never hear about any of the Saw side material? So many other horror villains get comic book miniseries and TV shows and video games that, even if they don't make a huge splash, at least get talked about sometimes, but Saw? Nah, not really. As far as I can tell, there's only been like one comic book miniseries and a bunch of theme park rides, only a few of which are still active. And as for video games, aside from some characters popping up in Dead by Daylight in recent years, only two were ever made. Saw the video game in 2009, and Saw 2 Blood and Flesh in 2010. And they never made enough of a splash to get talked about much, not even in a so bad it's funny kind of way, like the Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th NES games. Are these games any good? Are they forgettable slop or overlooked masterpieces? Do they capture the feel of Saw or crash and fail desperately trying? I don't know, nobody talks about them. So I'm just gonna hop on eBay real quick and buy both of them so we can- HOLY CRAP! Ah, uh, yeah, no way, Jose. I ain't paying that for a couple of two generations old games that nobody remembers exist. Well, at least the first game also had a PC release, so maybe I can't. It's delisted. Damn it. I really wanted to make a Saw video game video, but I guess I can't. Although, if I can't buy the first game, that technically makes it abandonware, so... Oh yeah, Saw on PC. Let's a go. Saw the video game was released in 2009, just a few weeks short of the release of Saw 6, and was developed by Zombie Studios, whose works mostly seem to consist of spec up games and the occasional licensed title like... a Disney Atlantis video game? Huh. Okay, you know what? You can officially consider me curious. Also, it looks like the game was published by Konami. Wow, I seem to be on a kick with their games recently. Who knows, maybe if I talk about them enough, they'll remember their video game company and release something new for a change. Yeah, and I'm Robert De Niro. But despite the release date, the game actually takes place between the first two Saw films and... Wait, hold on, where does that put us on the wheel again? There we go. Thanks, Vanna. You play as Detective Tap, the gung-ho cop from the first film who got a little bit too excited about catching the Jigsaw killer and ended up getting his partner Singh killed by ignoring police protocol. Although, since Zombie Studios couldn't secure the license to Danny Glover's likeness, the role of Detective Tap will be played this evening by his slightly less famous brother, Danny Tonic Trouble. Anyway, it turns out that John Kramer no likey boorish cowboy cops. He kidnaps Tap and heals his gunshot wound from the movie, and soon enough Tap finds himself trapped in an abandoned asylum, because abandoned asylums are spooky, you see, and he is then tasked with rescuing people from death traps who are all somehow connected to him. Some are his colleagues on the force, some are people his actions have affected in a negative way, and others simply fed into his obsession with catching Jigsaw. And to top it all off, not only is Pighead on your ass and seems intent to outright kill you rather than play games, the place is also full of dangerous criminals that Tap put away. And it just so happens that the key to the front door has been sewn into Tap's chest. 
So let's just say that they're all very eager to quench their thirst for freedom, and they're willing to do anything to get it straight from the tap. These are the jokes, people. Take them or leave them. So, before we get into the actual gameplay, I gotta give some kudos to Zombie Studios here. Even if I made a bit fun of the stereotypical abandoned asylum setting, this place looks great for a game from 2009. I mean, this place is huge, it's grimy looking, and it really looks probably abandoned and decrepit, making it a perfect setting for a Saw story. It's also generously covered in easy to read signs that show you where you need to go next, so unlike many other horror games I've played, you're very unlikely to get lost. Granted, that's also because the game is pretty linear, but I still appreciate some easy navigation. Add some spooky documents to read, a killer soundtrack, tons of rooms that show you the gory aftermath of some of Jigsaw's games, and a healthy splattering of blood when you mess up a task, and you're pretty much neck deep in a Saw mood right from the get-go. Although apparently Jigsaw just can't help but be his usual edgy bit self, and he's gone out of his way to scribble 7th grade emo poetry on every single wall he can possibly find. We here at Zombie Studios would like to remind our players that our game is very deep, dark, and thoughtful. And if you don't get it, it's because you're a filthy conformist normie who won't get off my back and understand that it's not a phase, mom! Great visuals aside though, you're quickly gonna realize that the controls feel a little odd. Aside from using WSD to move like most PC games, just about everything is controlled with your mouse and your number keys. I know this doesn't sound too bad, but it gets pretty awkward when you have to use your overly sensitive mouse to both move the camera, navigate puzzle minigames, and even do things like cross bridges by dragging it forward while keeping your balance. Not that doing any of this is hard exactly, but it is weird and finicky and it takes a little bit of getting used to. And nowhere is that more clear than in the goddamn combat, because man, the combat sucks! As you go through the asylum, you'll often run into other captives who want the key in your chest, and you really have no choice but to fight them with the various weapons that you find lying around all over the place. And I will give the game credit for this much, there is a pretty good variety of enemies, all things considered. Some dudes throw Molotov cocktails, others will activate the shotgun color you're wearing if you don't kill them quick enough, you got these safe head guys who can't see you, and then there's these Venus flytrap dudes who die on their own if you can dodge them for long enough. Or if you can just watch the trap go off after you already killed them for kicks. Well, with that attitude you're never getting ahead in life. <laughs> now, you might look at all these enemies and the sheer amount of weapons available and think to yourself, Oh cool, combat variety, but man, you're gonna be disappointed. They all play exactly the same. You hold down shift to get into a combat stance, you have a quick and a strong attack, and the weapon breaks after 5 to 6 uses. Of course, that's assuming you actually hit the damn thing. Not only are both of your attacks kind of slow and clumsy, but you have to aim them with your mouse. And that's a real chore, because the enemy's hitboxes seem to just be all over the place. The only real advantage to using bigger, heavier weapons is that you can use them to break holes in walls to find extra items, but that's really about it. Combat is a bitch regardless of what you use. It's much easier to either get your hands on some of these somewhat rare insta-kill guns, or just beat the hell out of people with your fists, since they're way faster than any weapon you'll find. I kind of wish I'd realized that last part before the very end of the game, but oh well. Yeah, that's it, Tap. Punch that giant man with an iron safe on his head. You can take him. And while we're on the subject of the controls, I gotta say that using the number keys is not much better. In what I assume is an attempt to keep the game free of too much UI cluttering up the screen, you don't actually get an inventory. Instead, various items and actions are tied to the number buttons. One and two are your interact buttons and are interchangeable with your mouse keys. 3 then uses your health item, and 4 uses your current light source item, whether that be the flashlight, the lighter, or the camera. I know this isn't unusual for PC games, but it can get a little bit clunky remembering which one does what sometimes. And when they do want to tell you to use these buttons, they don't do so very elegantly. It really breaks immersion when you open a door, activate a shotgun trap out of the one from Saw 1, and then the screen shows you a big flashy colored button for you to press before you get your head blown off. Yeah, it doesn't really fit with the griminess of the rest of the game now, does it? Oh yeah, the traps. I forgot about the traps. They're... um... there? I guess? I'm not talking about the major death traps just yet. Believe me, we'll get to those. But this asylum is full of smaller traps, and you can even build some yourself. The most commonly found traps are tripwires tied to shotguns, and believe me, these are gonna be the bane of your existence. But you may also find electrified water or gas leaks that you gotta fix. To do this, you pick up all sorts of items all the time. Fuses, shotgun shells, piano wire, valves, you name it. And using these you can do things like stop the gas leaks, disarm shotgun traps and turn off the electricity. And then you can reactivate them and use them against your enemies, which can be really fun. 
you can also build some smaller traps using these jigsaw workbenches. And I never used these. Like, not even once. I mean, you make them, you select it by pressing 6, put it down with a space key, and... Then what? You get the ability to make these traps pretty late, you can only make them at the very few workbenches sprinkled in there, the game never really tells you how to activate these as I recall, and it's much easier to just beat the hell out of people or trick them into running into other traps anyway. So, they kinda feel a little slapped on to me. Besides, there's already plenty of items in your inventory for all the damn minigames you're gonna be playing. Seriously, aside from enemies and the environmental traps that I've already mentioned, your main hindrance as you go through the asylum is gonna be all these freaking minigames. Now, there's nothing wrong with the Asylum being a death trap riddled rat maze, that's totally in line with Jigsaw's MO, but good god did he run out of ideas fast this time around. There's like six of these minigames, and when you're not fighting somebody, they're basically all you'll ever be doing. See a weapon locked in a case? Put the cocks in correctly. Need to activate power? Play pipes for a while. Lock door? Match the symbols. Gas leak? Then connect these pipes. Need a key? Don't worry, you can find one in this toilet full of syringes. Or this acid barrel. Again, and again, and again, and again, again, again. Yeah, see, that was shocking and everything when it happened once in Saw 2. You really gotta step it up, guys. Oh, but of course, every now and then Jigsaw does decide to give you a proper puzzle to solve. Uh, depending on your definition of puzzle, that is. A particular favorite trick of Jigsaw's is to trap you in a room full of explosives and make you look for the combination for the padlock, but it's usually just a matter of matching up some symbols to see a number or peek through a hole somewhere, and there it is, clear as day. The time limit is really the only thing making this remotely difficult. But hey, just in case you aren't too impressed with these mind-blowing environmental puzzles, don't you worry. Here's a literal Jigsaw puzzle for you to solve, because this game is just clever like that. Now, there are moments where the game tries to get a little bit more creative with it, but as much as I appreciate these, they're honestly kind of rare. For example, here you had to figure out which of these patients have a key inside them. And in the graveyard, you had to figure out which grave you can take a key from without getting shot. The answer is Sing's grave, by the way. Symbolism! There's also a spot very early in the game where Jigsaw makes you choose between a sighted and a blind path. The sighted path leads you through a gauntlet of insta-death traps that you gotta dodge with some timing, while the blind path has you try to navigate a pitch-black room. Ah, but you have several different light items in the game, so fuck you, Jigsaw. I'll just turn on my lighter and... This one is a bad idea if you only have the lighter, so, um, just... Just do the sighted path, okay? Honestly, I would have loved to see more of this sprinkle throughout the game. Instead, it just ends up feeling like you're spending an hour at a time running around doing the same 4-6 to six mini games over and over again until you finally get to a major plot important trap. And while it all functions well enough, it gets really tedious really fast. But, let's be real for a second. You're not here because you want to watch me ranting about clunky gameplay, are you? <laughs> no, 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 no. I got your number. You're here for the same reason that people keep flocking to every new Saw movie. You're here to see the death traps. Oh, they're here all right, and what a gallery of weirdos we have to save this time. We've got a couple of more personal victims, like a corrupt cop that Tap turned a blind eye to, and Detective Singh's wife who grew distant to her son after her husband's death. We've also got a couple of minor characters mentioned in the first film, like Oswald McGillicuddy, the reporter who came up with the name Jigsaw Killer and made a career of dragging Tap's name through the mud. There's also Jeff from the first movie, who was driven to suicide out of sheer pressure after Tap refused to stop interrogating him for info on Jigsaw long after his escape. And then there's just some rando named Obi who wants to be tested by Jigsaw and gets real mad when you save him. But apparently this Obi in a furnace trap is not the same Obi in a furnace trap as this Obi in a furnace trap, so that means there are two different Obis in two different furnace traps and... Oh, and also, um... Amanda is here again, for some reason? Yeah, see, I'm no expert on the Saw lore or anything, but wasn't it made pretty clear that Amanda basically became Jigsaw's apprentice, like, immediately after escaping the first trap? Am I getting that wrong? Did I miss something? I don't know, man. The game tries to be in line with the film's canon, but it's pretty freaking muddled. Anyway, the traps. I love the traps. They're cool, you get the Jigsaw recording explaining the theming, they get gory as hell when you fail and the folks inside of them die, and they essentially function as this game's version of bosses for each stage. They're everything you want from a Saw game. Except for the part where you beat them by playing slightly harder versions of the same goddamn minigames you've been playing the whole time, are you fucking kidding me?! Okay, to be fair, half of them are unique. Amanda has this weird tip the ball in the right hole game, Melissa requires you to slide around magnetic blocks, and Jeff gets a game of match the symbols with a little bit of memory thrown in. 
Oh, really? Does the foot and the hacksaw go together, game? Yeah, I see what you did there. Very nice. Here's a gold star on your report card. <sighs> I don't know, man. It just seems to me like they came up with a bunch of traps and, quite frankly, stole a couple from the movies, and then just completely forgot to plan any gameplay around them. And so what should have been a big, tense and important event just becomes a cutscene quickly followed by a lame minigame. And I mean, where's the fun in that? Where's the tension in that? Where's the excitement in that? Never mind that every time you save someone from a trap, the exact same thing happens. Since this game is about Tap and how his obsession with Jigsaw ruins everything he touches, every victim is freed, immediately blames Tap for everything, then runs off or gets killed in basically the very next scene, leaving you alone once more. None of them help you out, none of them mean anything to the game after you free them, and most frustratingly, none of them can die permanently in the traps! You know how one of the really fun things about the Saw movies is seeing how people react when they wake up in these traps? Seeing what kind of choices they make, seeing if they're willing to mutilate themselves horribly in order to survive, and trying to guess who actually makes it out alive and who dies? Yeah, there's none of that here. If you don't free them, you just get a game over and then you get to try again until you do, at which point they do like I just said. Run off or die from something else. There's no consequence to letting anyone die. There's nothing to be gained from saving anyone aside from advancing the game. In other words, unlike most Saw stories, who lives and who dies has no effect on the actual ending. Because the endings... Oh boy, the endings. Oh boy, yeah, uh, let's just fast forward a bit so we can get to those, shall we? As you continue to play the game, Jigsaw will constantly pop up to ramble about how Tap needs to let go of his obsession, all while leading you through the facility by your no- Wait, what's that say? No men past this point? Ah, damn it! The gosh ding dang dog feminazis are ruining my video games again! Oh, it's all the fucking pronoun fault, I tell ya! Ahem. <coughs> Anyway, things do hit a little bit of a snag. Because this game's version of Pighead seems to have gone rogue and has no intention of actually letting anyone live. He instead repeatedly hinders your way and even outright tries to kill you close to the game's end, leading to one of the only real boss fights the game has to offer. And I'm sure this was meant to be a big and epic showdown, but it should have cooked in the furnace a little bit longer. First of all, Pighead just shows up and if he grabs you, you enter this weird grapple mini game that the game never bothers actually telling you how to play. Second, you then just wake up in another explosion rig room with another electricity puzzle before you can head outside to fight him again. And if you get grappled, well, back to that room you go. So there you are, trying desperately not to get grabbed by Pighead while you figure out how to win the fight. You can beat him to death if you're careful and patient enough. Or you can be super smart and use the environment against him to zap him with electricity. Which would probably have been really cool if my music hadn't glitched out and left me defeating him in cold awkward silence. Well, anyway, some more shenanigans later, Jigsaw presents Tap with two doors, one marked Truth and one marked Freedom, and gives him only one key. To quote Jigsaw, Tap can either keep pursuing him to find the answers he wants, or he can allow everyone trapped in the asylum to escape by simply giving it up and going home. This choice is what determines your ending, and in trying to roleplay a little bit, I figured that Tap wouldn't give up so easily, so I picked Truth. Chasing Jigsaw further into the maze, Tap finally corners and beats the ever-loving hell out of him, only to discover that he is in fact Melissa, Singh's wife. Turns out that the real Jigsaw approached her after her game and told her that he had kidnapped her son, and that he would only let her see him again if she kept Tap going through the game. And also if she promises the T-Pose for like two frames in this cutscene apparently. And to make sure she didn't reveal this, he even went so far as to sew her mouth shut. Gross. Trying to escape from Tap's brutal beatdown, Melissa then runs away, and straight into a shotgun trap that takes her out on the spot. Seeing the consequences of his desire to defeat Jigsaw firsthand finally drives Tap completely mad, and he gets sent to a different asylum, fully believing himself to be eternally stuck in one of Jigsaw's wicked games, with no one for company but his own twisted obsession. This is definitely the most interesting ending. But it's not the canon one. The real ending is freedom, where Tap decides that human lives matter more than his vendetta and everyone goes free. But knowing what his actions have cost and frustrated at never learning the truth, he ends up sitting down in his apartment and decides to end it all. And while I've seen more of these off-screen suicide scenes than I can freaking count at this point, I will say that making you watch the credits on the TV screen as you wait to hear the sound of the gunshot is actually a pretty cool idea. 
Nice job, Zombie Studios. And the reason I know that this is the canon ending is because in the sequel you play as Tab's son who's trying to figure out why his dad did what he did. And from what I can tell, it got much worse reviews than the first game did. And I can't exactly say that's a great sign because Saw the video game is not that great to begin with. It's serviceable overall, I would say. Like I've mentioned, it certainly gets the feel of Saw right, it looks the part, and it's full to the brim with all the gore and self-important motive rants you could possibly want from the franchise. But the actual game itself is... fine, I guess? Or, well, it is if you enjoy doing the same handful of minigames over and over between cutscenes, I suppose. It just ends up feeling a little bit half-baked. I don't doubt that effort was put into this game, but it seems like they had like three hours worth of game that they stretched out to eight by replacing all these potentially interesting gameplay scenarios with random minigames that they could just repeat infinitely if they needed to. The real strong point here is the story, even if it hits a few snags with the inconsequential victims and some weird continuity hiccups. Continuing Tap's story and dealing with the price of obsession is a cool idea, and it does a good job at picking out a few interesting things that were mentioned offhand or kind of discarded in the first film, which I really appreciate. From what I've read, James Wan and Lee Wanell did actually assist in writing the game, and as far as I'm concerned, it shows. The spirit is certainly intact. But that's about all it has going for it that's particularly special. At the end of the day, the game is a perfectly serviceable, if occasionally kind of clunky, little spooky romp. It probably will entertain a few hardcore Saw fans for a few hours. But if you're looking for some kind of amazing Lost Saw sequel, or you just want a more solid, truly memorable horror game experience, then honestly, I'd suggest you look elsewhere. So that's it, folks. I hope you enjoyed hearing me talk about the Saw video game, and I hope you're all looking forward to a wonderful spooky month. Just try not to play too many tricks on the wrong people out there, or you might find yourself playing a very different game. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go write my next video. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Halloween everybody and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed yourself, don't forget to click the like button and leave a little comment, possibly about some of your favorite saw traps. Why not? That's a fun discussion. And while you're busy doing that, I'll just go ahead and give some special thanks to Andreas Wilsom, Half Cryptid, Pocket Mouse, Elinor Strohel, John G. Robinson, John Aljets, The Danish Penguin, Warren Miller, and Silvermoon Ravenwolf, as well as anyone else who supports me on Patreon. I super appreciate it, people. Thank you so much. If you want to support me too, you can find my Patreon link in the description below, along with a link to my Discord server, which you're more than welcome to join. And as usual, if you just happen to find this channel just now, don't forget to subscribe for more spooky, obscure, and weird media videos in the future. See you then, everybody, and bye-bye.